We're going to continue our series entitled God's Mighty Acts. Let me pray for our hearts as we get ready to open up God's Word. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will make us a yes people. Lord, you have said yes to us in creation. You have said yes to us in our birth. You have said yes to us through salvation in your Son. You have said yes to us in baptism. Yet, Father, we are a perhaps or maybe or we'll see kind of people. Father, I pray that you will move us from being a perhaps people to a yes people this morning. I pray that you will help us move out of what might be comfortable or familiar into what might be risky and call for our lives. I pray, Father, that you'll help us say yes to the gospel and that you'll help us say yes to the call of making the gospel known to a world that so desperately needs it. I'm sorry for the times, Lord, that our hesitation, our perhaps, maybe, or we'll see attitude has gotten in the way of our obedience. And so I pray now through the working of your word that you will speak, that you will bring us to a place of great confidence by the hearing of your word preached, and that you will help us leave here saying yes to whatever it is you have for us. I'm yours, reporting for duty. Have your way with me now. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up with me to the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 9, verse 10 through 19. Acts chapter 9, verse 10 through 19. It's found on page 917 in the Bibles in front of you. You can use those Bibles or follow along on the Grace Chapel app. I've entitled my message today, What Does God Want From Me? Perhaps that's a question you've asked in your Christian life before. God, what do you want from me? Uh, You maybe have wondered, God, what's your will for me? Where am I supposed to go? If you're a Christian and you've given your life to Christ, then you know there was probably a moment where you said, God, what do you want from me? How do I get saved? What does it look like for me to be saved? Uh, These are all questions that I think we ask. And even as we walk through our Christian life, we will say to the Lord, Lord, I need to know your will. What do you want from me? What is your plan for me? Certainly, the man that we're going to encounter in this passage today was asking that question. God, what do you want from me? And God had a specific assignment, something he needed him to accomplish. So we're going to unpack this passage. We're looking at Acts chapter 9, verse 10 through 19. We're going to unpack this passage. It's about a man named Ananias. It's the second part of a conversion story of a man named Saul who comes to know the Lord and follow the Lord. We're going to unpack the details of it. I'm going to spend about the first half of our message or so unpacking the details of this passage. But then I'm going to answer three questions that I believe this passage asks. Three questions we should ask in light of this passage about God, about grace, and about ourselves. We'll end with this all too familiar question, God, what do you want from me at the end of our time together? Let's unpack Acts chapter 9, 10 through 19. Let me read it in its entirety and unpack it in its context and then apply it to our lives. Listen carefully. This is God's word. It says this, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be fulfilled with the Holy Spirit or be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. 
Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. If you're just joining us as we study the book of Acts, we've been in this book for a while. We will be here for quite some time, but we're unpacking it slowly to understand the expansion of God's church and specifically understand God's mighty acts. These are uh, the things God did through his people. Now, the book of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles. I call it the Acts of God through the Apostles. It was really God doing a mighty work through them. We studied how God came in man form, Jesus Christ. He lived, which is recorded for us in the Gospels. He died, he rose again, and after his resurrection, he lived with the early church for some time. We read about that in Acts chapter 1. Before he left this earth, he told them that they were to go and to make known his commandments, to make his name great in all of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, he gave them the means by which they would be able to do that. The Holy Spirit of God would now dwell in the hearts of people. He would be giving them power to be able to accomplish his mission. From Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter 7, we see the expansion of the church. Many thousands of people coming to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then in Acts chapter 8, we see the first persecution happen of a man named Stephen, a man who believed in Jesus Christ but was killed for his faith. He was killed under the approval of a man named Saul. At the end of Acts chapter 7, we see that Saul approved of these Jewish leaders killing the Christians for believing in Christ. In Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it says that Saul approved of Stephen's execution. And in Acts chapter 8 verse 3, it says that Saul was literally going house to house, breaking into the homes most likely, and pulling the Christians out ravishing the church, killing the Christians, putting them in prison, and persecuting them for their belief in Christ. This man named Saul, he was kind of a chief persecutor, chief of sinners for sure. He was coming against the Christians, and we see him have a Jesus moment, a God moment in Acts chapter 9. He's going from Jerusalem to Damascus, some hundred plus miles of a journey, to go persecute the Christians who are in Damascus. He's on his way, and Jesus Christ shows up in front of him, the risen Jesus Christ. Now, again, we've seen Jesus Christ, 500 plus witnesses had seen Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead, so we know it's not only biblically true, but historically true. And then you have here in this instance, Paul, who saw the risen Christ, not when he came right after the resurrection, but now sometime later. He's going on the road, Jesus Christ is standing in front of him, everyone else can hear Jesus' voice, but they can't see him. Paul, or named Saul, sees him and is totally, totally taken back by the presence of the risen Christ. His eyes are now blind. He goes to Damascus. He's there for three days. And at the end of verse 9, it tells us that he didn't eat or drink for three days. Quite an amazing experience. Now, he's referred to as Saul here in this passage, and he will be until Acts chapter 13, verse 9. He's called Saul. That's his Hebrew name. His more popular Roman name would be Paul. It was very normal for them to have two different names at this time. So after Acts chapter 13, verse 9, we'll see him referred to as Paul. In fact, he refers himself to himself as Paul ongoing because I think it was the best way for him to present himself to a Roman world. It gave him a little bit more of an in. This man, Saul, for now, we'll go with that. This man, Saul, he, he's now waiting in the darkness for some kind of clarity on what just happened. And meanwhile, while he's in Damascus waiting, Jesus shows up again. So Jesus shows up first to Saul on the road, and now he shows up again to Ananias. And I imagine that there might even be another time that he showed up to Saul to tell Saul what was going to happen. We see in the passage that he was told or saw a vision that there would be a man named Ananias who would come in and lay his hands on him. So all that to say, Jesus was busy, all right? Jesus was making his appearances, getting some work done, shows up to Saul, shows up to Ananias, and he gives Ananias very clear direction. This is, by the way, this is not the Ananias of Acts chapter 5. Remember that guy? He's already dead, okay? He died with his wife Sapphira. They stole from the church. They're dead. This is a different Ananias, maybe a little bit better, more righteous Ananias. Now he is on a mission from God to now help in the conversion, the changing of murderer to missionary, of Christian hater to now Christ follower, of this man named Saul. 
He gives them a very clear direction. He says, go to the street called Straight. Go to the house of Judas. And look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. It's very clear. The street called Straight would have been uh, perhaps one of the most popular streets in all of Damascus. In fact, if you go to Damascus today, which is the capital of Syria, that street is still there. The street called Straight is still in Damascus. It goes from east to west. In the Bible time, it would have been about 40 feet wide. It would have had columns all the way down the sides. We see many of the remains of these Roman columns and these Roman arches that would have been over this main street. It would have been a place where there would have been some kind of market, people selling all sorts of things in between the colonnades. So he would have known Straight Street, okay? Ananias most likely already lived in Damascus. I do not think he was one who escaped from Jerusalem and went to Damascus. I think he already lived in Damascus, and my reason for that is more details than you need, but in Acts chapter 22, verse 12, Paul, when he's telling his story later about how he was changed, he says there was a man in Damascus who feared the Lord and had a good reputation among the Jews. So I would imagine that he lived there long enough to have a good reputation. He was a man who was God-fearing, and a man who had maybe come to Christ. We don't know how he came to Christ, but he came to Christ, and now Christ himself appears to him. Christ appears to him, and, and you notice in the beginning of this passage we're looking at today in verses 10 and 11, the, the word Lord is used three different times. The Lord said to him, and then he replied, here I am, Lord, and then the Lord said to him. It doesn't exactly tell us that this is Jesus Christ who is appearing to him, but by the content of the conversation, we can assume that this is Christ, very safely assume this. For Christ says he's going to be my chosen instrument. Three different times later on in his exchange with Ananias, he says that he will go out and make my name great. Or Ananias said, listen, he's coming against your name. So most likely Ananias was clear this was Christ. And Christ himself is identifying him, himself by saying, my name must go out. So the risen Christ, standing before Ananias, tells him what he's supposed to do very specifically Though, Ananias has a couple questions. Are you sure you got this right? This doesn't feel right. Do you know who he is? As if Ananias had to somehow tell God who Saul was. As if Jesus would suddenly go, oh, is that the guy? Is that the guy that's been persecuting people? Oh, I didn't know that. There was nothing like that. Ananias, is, I, he's the one who, I have heard about him. He, he's doing all sorts of things that are evil against Christians in Jerusalem. And oh, by the way, did you know that he has a letter from the Sanhedrin, the 72 rulers in Jerusalem, that he can kill whoever he wants? And Jesus is like, yes, I know. And my instruction was clear. I think there's a life principle here that is worth noting. Though God's ways are mysterious, his will for us is not mysterious. There will be times where God asks us to do something that doesn't quite make sense to us. Why would you have me do that? Why would you have me go there? Why would you have me talk to him? Why would you have me live with her? Why would you have me do this or that or, or work here or work there? We, we, don't, we don't understand because God has a mysterious way about him where he's working all things together for his glory and for our good. So his way may be mysterious. In fact, the Bible tells us many times that the ways of God are mysterious but his will for us is not mysterious. What I mean by that is we know what we are to do. The Bible has been very clear. Jesus Christ from his own mouth was very clear that we are to go and to make his fame known to all of the earth. In Matthew, we see Jesus' words captured in a statement that we call the Great Commission, where he says, go into all the ends of the earth, teaching them everything I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's clear his will is clear. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 27, he tells them to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Tell them everything. Tell them about me. You see, his will for us is that we make his name known. His will for us is that we continue to bring him glory by calling people to believe in him. There is no question about it. I've had people sit in my counseling office or talk to me just at church uh, between services and say, oh, I'm just not sure what the Lord wants me to do. I'm, I'm not sure what his direction is for me. Listen, I understand. I've been there too. I've cried myself to sleep in my past too, wondering, God, what are you doing? Because your ways seem mysterious. But his will for us is never mysterious. 
His will for us is that we bring him glory. His will for us is that we proclaim the gospel to everyone around us. That is our hope and that is what we are to do. Who and where and what and when, some of that may be mysterious for us, but the gospel itself is not a mystery and the call to share the gospel is not a mystery. So Ananias is called to go share the gospel. He doesn't seem to question that by any means. But here in this passage, he does have a couple questions. Lord, are you sure you know who this is? Perhaps he had heard about Saul and the persecution that he'd brought on them. So he's making sure Jesus knows. Jesus is like, basically, yes, I know. Verse 16, look what he says. Go. Basically, like, enough with your questions. Go. Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Chosen instrument, that phrase can literally be thought of as kind of like a a casket or a container. Think of it like a missionary casket. Uh, this, This container, this vessel that is dead, but what is on the inside is important. Or in this case, what is on the inside is alive. Though he is a dead vessel, the inside of him will bring life. Who he is chosen by me and what he will accomplish for me is what is most important. He will take my name to, and he doesn't list Israel first, which is normal. Normally, they list Israel first. Israel's listed last. He says, you will take my name to the Gentiles, to the kings, and to the children of Israel. As if to say, this chosen vessel is the very one who's going to help expand the gospel to a world that is not Jewish, to the Gentile world that desperately needs to hear the truth. Yes, he will take it to the chosen children of Israel, but he will preach to Gentiles and pagans and Romans and Roman rulers. He is my chosen instrument. And then Christ goes on to say, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake or for the sake of my name. This wasn't a statement of retribution. He wasn't saying, well, go, okay, oh, oh, that's who we're dealing with, the Christian persecutor? Thank you for telling me, Ananias. Go tell him that he's going to suffer. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, go. He's my chosen instrument. And get this, he will suffer for my name. It wasn't a threat, but it was a promise of redemption. Because we know that Paul himself even said later, though I suffer and die, I suffer and die for Christ's name so that I may be more like him. All the suffering that I go through just helps me know him all the more. So suffering is a a, a blessing. It's It's a way that I get to know my Savior and his pain. So here Christ says to Ananias, I will show him how he will suffer for my name's sake. Oh, what a statement of redemption. And verse 17 starts a new scene. Ananias throws off the covers. He gets up out of the bed after he's seen this vision, and he goes to Saul and does exactly as Christ said. Here's something I think I can observe from Ananias. He is obedient. And obedience to God is the result of bold faith. He obeys what Christ told him to do. Why? Because he had bold faith. He believed that what Christ had said was true. He he believed that this really was the risen Lord. So he throws off the covers. He walks down straight street. He knocks on the door of Judas, probably shaking in his sandals because he knows there's a Christian hater on the other side. And he now hears the creak of the door. Perhaps it's Judas who opens the door. He walks into this man's home and he sees Saul there with something that's on his eyes, something like scales. Luke, the author, doesn't even know how else to explain it. It's like scales, something flaky, these, these things that were over his eyes. He had like scales on his eyes and he's praying. Jesus had at least promised that he'd be praying, which probably means he's not much of a threat if he's praying. Maybe he's repenting. That was probably all in Ananias' mind. I hope this is going to go well. I hope it's fine. I can't imagine who else was present. At least Judas was, right? The owner of the home. I would imagine that he was present. Maybe his wife. Some believe that maybe they were already Christians and here they are being used by God to house this man who will be turned missionary. Perhaps there were other Christians in Damascus who knew Ananias, and so they said, brother, we'll pray for you. Or maybe he said, will you come with me and pray for me? I'm going to go talk to Saul. You're going to go talk to who? Saul. Okay, we'll stay outside and pray for you, right? And so they prayed for him. He walks in. He sees this man, and he's bold in his faith, obedient to the words of Christ. And out of his boldness and out of his obedience, he says, 
brother Saul. He calls him brother. He calls him brother. First thing out of his mouth, he says, brother Saul. As if he's saying, I already believe what Jesus said. You listen, I, I wasn't all on this train. I didn't think you were the rest pick, but Christ told me you were the best pick. So I'm all in on this and I'm calling you brother because you're with us and Christ can take you and he can redeem you. So he says to him with such a gracious tone, brother Saul. And then he speaks to him about what he would do and what he could do. He says, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's amazing. And then something like scales fall off his eyes. These flaky things fall to the ground. I think there's a lot missing here. I mean, there has to be, right? And that's okay that we don't know it all, but I, I imagine there was all sorts of emotion. Yes, of course, fear, perhaps some uh, timidity happening on Ananias' part, but then this man gets up who hasn't eaten, who hasn't drank, who has scales fall off of his eyes, and he stands up, and he looks around, and he can see, and he's now filled with the Holy Spirit, and he speaks with excitement. I can see your face. I can see you. I can see you, Judas. I can see your faces. I am filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and for three days, I've done nothing but think about how I came against Christians, and for three days, I couldn't get the image of Christ out of my mind. Mind. And now I'm going to live for him and run for him and preach for him. And I imagine this had to be just a moment of absolute excitement. So much so that now Ananias and Judas and all those who are in the house are like, let's baptize this brother. Let's get this official now. So they walk down, which may have been even a half a mile walk to the river that flows through Damascus. And they baptize him and get him food. And he regains his strength. And this Christian hater, the very man who could have killed Ananias if Jesus wouldn't have stopped him, is now celebrating with Ananias that Jesus has transformed him. <laughs> I love that. So what does all this teach us? Before we answer three questions that I think this passage begs, let me say this. I believe this passage teaches us that God does not need us, but God chooses to use us to call people to follow him. My friends, God does not need us. You see, on the road to Damascus, Jesus would have been just fine to complete the work in Saul's life. He had already appeared to him. He could have said, listen, this is it. It's over. Let's heal you right now, spiritually speaking. Let's allow you to stand up, no longer be a Christian hater, and you could be off to the races, and why don't you run into Damascus, and why don't you go in there and share the gospel? It could have never included Ananias. It could have never included the three days of darkness. He could have just right then and there saved him and completed the work. But I see in the book of Acts, and I see elsewhere in Scripture, that Jesus does something where he chooses to use people to fulfill his will and specifically call people unto salvation. In this instance, he's choosing to use Ananias to fulfill his will. He didn't need him, but he chose him. He chooses to use us even to call people to follow him. So I think that begs three questions, and in our final 10 minutes together, I want to ask these three questions and hopefully answer them biblically. First, first question is, by whose effort are people saved? This question begs, by whose effort was Saul saved? The second question is, how is God's grace revealed? In other words, what finally broke through the hard heart of Saul? And the third question is, what does God want from me? First question, by whose effort are people saved? When we talk about a person being saved, we, we, what we are saying is that they are saved from the wrath of God. A person to be saved isn't just that they are saved from their sins. Christians will often say, and even sing, that we have been saved from our sins. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been saved. I've given my life to Jesus Christ, but I still sin. Sin is not all the way gone from me. And to be honest, it won't be all the way gone from me until I'm finally with Christ. 
Hopefully I'm forever fighting sin. Hopefully I'm getting better. Hopefully I'm becoming more sanctified is the Bible's word, more like Christ in this life. But I won't be away from sin or saved from sin until I'm glorified, until I'm with Christ fully. So to say that we're saved from sin, it's true, but it's a, it's a coming truth. There is a day where I will be saved from sin most fully. When I say that I am saved, what I'm saying is that I'm saved from God's wrath. You see, we have sinned against an eternal God. That deserves an eternal punishment. So we are saved from the wrath that we deserve. And that happens now. Yes, I will go on sinning, but God will continue to forgive me. I'll strive not to sin. I'll pursue Christ so that I don't sin. But, but when I do sin, I know that I'm saved from the wrath of God that I deserve for my sin. So that's what it means to be saved. Okay, so back to the question. By whose effort then is a person saved? Well, it's clear that a person is saved by God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty saves souls. When we say that God is sovereign, what we're saying is that He is all-powerful, that He is all-knowing, and that He is all-present. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, all the time. Those three things at play all the time make Him sovereign. It means that He has all power, all knowledge, all wisdom, all ability to save a person whenever He wants so he can call a person, no matter how hard, hearted they are, he can transform their life. Do you believe in God's sovereignty? Well, here's a litmus test to see if you do. If you've ever thanked God for your salvation, or if you've ever prayed for salvation for someone else, then I would say you believe in sovereignty, especially as it relates to salvation, because you believe that you need to ask or talk to God or thank God for saving a soul. God is the only one who saves a soul. That's what we'll call divine sovereignty. Okay, so that's divine sovereignty. But by whose effort are people saved? Well, God has effort in it, but certainly there's some kind of human effort, right? Yes, divine sovereignty and human responsibility are working together for salvation, but divine sovereignty and human responsibility are not opposing ideas. They both are working together for a soul to be saved. God is the one who saves a soul. But we are saved by faith alone. We have faith in Jesus Christ. So we express faith. We have a hum human responsibility of having faith in God. As we have faith in God, then we are saved. There is a human responsibility and there is divine sovereignty at play in our salvation. And the same is true when it comes to evangelism, sharing the gospel. Divine sovereignty is working on the hearts of those we will share the gospel with. Human responsibility is ours to share the gospel. Our efforts are used by God so that his son will be known. God can do it without us. He could have done it without Ananias, but he chooses to use humans and the responsibility that he lays upon us to accomplish his will. Sovereignty and human responsibility, they work together. Uh, think about how my favorite preacher explains it, Spurgeon, you, you knew who that was. My favorite preacher explains it as two railroad tracks that are driving towards the same goal. As you stand on the railroad tracks, you see the glory at the end. You see that they merge somehow, that something comes together for some final purpose. But there is divine sovereignty as one track and human responsibility as the other track. And they're both going towards the same goal. If I emphasize divine sovereignty too much and say God will save who he wants to save, I have no reason to do anything, then I'm excluding human responsibility. And if I overemphasize human responsibility and say, well, it's all up to us, it's all about our choosing and what we do and who we share with, then we're excluding divine sovereignty. Both of these things work together for God's will to be accomplished in a person's life. It may be mysterious to us, but that we're supposed to do it and be involved in it, that's not a mystery. We know that God has been clear about that. So I would conclude by answering the first question this way. By whose effort are people saved? Well, evangelism is both divine sovereignty and human responsibility. So evangelism is by both God and man working together to make his grace known in a person's life. Now, let me be clear. The sovereignty of God doesn't need our efforts, but our efforts are so desperately in need of the sovereignty of God. And these things work together and God chooses in his sovereignty to allow humans to be involved in people being called to follow him. This is risky work. This is 
work that is not always safe or comfortable. There might be people you're called to share the gospel with that doesn't feel good to you. You have to risk relationships. You're you're going to have to speak up when you don't want to speak up. But listen, we didn't get into Christianity because we thought it was safe. We came to Jesus Christ because he said, if you lay your life down for me, you will gain life. So we lay our life down and we risk for him. I was thinking about this in the context of recent events. Uh, there's this place in the Gaza Strip called Netzyarim. It's, a, it's actually a Jewish settlement in the, the Gaza Strip. And uh, Pastor Steve Whitlock and I were talking recently when all the conflict was going on in Israel in the Gaza Strip. Are there any believers in the Gaza Strip? And, and we didn't know. And he went and looked up some and he found a little bit of remnants. I found a little bit, but not much. It's hard to find people that are believers in the Gaza Strip because most of them are underground, meaning they're not going to put big things on the internet about their belief in Christ, but they're living it out faithfully. I found a story about a believer in Netzarim, Gaza, who said, I don't live here because it's safe. I live here because it's what God wants me to do. And I thought about that in the context of our life. Sometimes we're so timid when it comes to bringing up the gospel with friends or coworkers or people we hang out with. Listen, we are bold with the gospel and we don't worry about being safe or popular or liked. We do it because it's right. It's our effort and divine sovereignty working together, which leads to the second question. How is God's grace revealed? If it's our efforts used by a sovereign God to make the gospel clear, then how is God's grace revealed? Well, a couple things I would say. First of all, the grace of God must be clearly proclaimed. Paul said that in Romans, that they won't hear unless we open our mouths and speak it. So we must proclaim the gospel. We must make all parts of the gospel clear. All parts. I summarize the gospel as God, man, Christ, response. Uh, This is the full gospel. Let me explain it to you. At the beginning of time, way back in Genesis, God created man to live in an unhindered relationship with him. Then man came in, humankind, mankind came in and sinned. We sinned against God. And because we sinned against God, then we needed Christ, who came and died on the cross for our sins, rose again so that we could be forgiven and back into an unhindered relationship with God, which demands then for us a response. We must respond to the gospel with faith, turning from our sin and turning towards God. Most Christians, when I ask them, what is the gospel? They'll say, well, the gospel is Jesus Christ. He came, he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again. And I want to say, well, yes, yes, it is. That's the climax of the gospel. That is the highest point of the gospel. But, but the gospel starts all the way back to the beginning in that God created us in His image. God created for us to have an unhindered relationship with Him. And then sin came in and it messed it all up. And before I have someone be saved by the gospel, I have to help them be lost in their sin. I have to help them understand their need for God. So the gospel is the whole gospel and making it clear that we have a desperate need for a Savior. Our world doesn't know why they need Christ. Your unsaved friends, you go explain to them, well, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Wow, I don't understand why that's relevant to me, most non-Christians would say. But when you help them understand that they are lost and that there is a God, that they're created in His image, that loves them and has all the mercy and grace for them and the only way that they can access God's love and mercy and grace is by having their sins forgiven, not counted against them, then all of a sudden the gospel and all of its beauty becomes more clear. You have to help them understand what they are saved from. No longer do I have God's wrath against me, but I have life and mercy and grace and love. So God's grace is revealed by his people being clear about the gospel. God's grace is displayed by our love for God and our love for other people. As we love God and love other people, which is the greatest commandment, if we love God and love other people, then we will have a continuous stirring in our heart of a concern for the fame of God. I want him to be known. I want him to be famous. I want him to be unavoidable in my friendships and in my neighborhood and in my relationships. You will love God so much that you want to make sure that he's known and you will also care for others so much and that by your care for them, they will see, wow, you care for me enough to risk and to tell me about the way that I can have true life. My friends, How is God's grace revealed? 
God's grace is revealed when we make the love of God clear in our actions, but also our words, and by loving God above all things, by sharing all parts of the gospel, God's grace is clear when a person understands the depths of their own sin and the surpassing depths of God's love. Imagine for a moment that you hiked with God up to a high cliff. You're standing on this cliff and say God shows up in, in Christ form, in bodily form. Christ is there standing with you on this cliff. And, and behind you is a bag full of stuff. It's like all the stuff of your life. And Christ said, what's that? And you say, well, it's just a bag. And he said, well, we, what's in the bag? You kind of avoid the question. It's just stuff. It's stuff. And what's in the bag is your good works, but also your sins. And he says, well, open it up. And so you, okay, fine. So you open up and you pull out the best thing you can find. And you say, look at how good this is. Look at how selfless I was for you. Look at, look at all the things I did for you. And he goes, ooh, that's impressive. Throw it over the cliff. You sure we shouldn't keep it? No. Just throw it over the cliff. So you drop it over the cliff. You pull out the next thing. Well, look at this. Isn't this great? Look at what I did for you. And you, he says, oh, Wow. Throw it over the cliff. And so you throw it over the cliff, and finally you're left with nothing but bad things in the bag. He goes, is there anything left? And you say, there's some things left, but I don't think we should talk about those things. He says, just pull it out. So you pull out something, and you're like, you don't want to look at this. And he's like, I already know. I already know what it is. And, and you say, no, you, you don't want to see it. Yeah, just show it to me. And you hold it up, and you say, this, this is my sin. This is when I was selfish. This is when I sinned. This is when I chased pleasure more than I pursued you. I didn't want you to see this. And he said, uh, throw it over the cliff. You throw it over the cliff. You pull the next thing out. It's gross. It's ugly. It's sin. He says, throw it over the cliff. You throw it over the cliff. As you're throwing things over the cliff, he seems to be getting more joyful as he realizes all this is gone. And you seem to be getting more joyful as you realize all this is gone. And all of a sudden, you're both looking over the cliff with nothing left but an empty bag and there's nothing down there. And he says to you, listen, as deep as that is, and as much as that is, and all of your junk that just got thrown over the edge, my grace is more than all of that. It's more than your greatest works that you think are good. It's more than your most grotesque sins that you're embarrassed of. My love for you is greater. Isn't that great? Imagine, my friends. Imagine, my friends, realizing for a moment that the, the depths of God's love are greater than all of your worst sins and even your greatest works. My friends, that moment is when grace is revealed. And that's what your unsaved friends need, and that's what you need and I need, but we must be faithful to share it. So that leads to my final question and conclusion. What does God want from me? Here's what I think God wants from you. He wants you to be obedient to his promptings. When he prompts you to share the gospel, he wants you to speak of grace and speak of the depths of his love. What does God want from you? He wants you to be obedient when he speaks. For when he prompts you in your mind, in your heart, in your thoughts, you know you have to do something, then do it and be obedient to it. I think if we could hear a conversation in hell, it might go something like this. You'd hear one demon say to the other demon, well, I guess we should go convince them that God's love is not good enough. And then the other demon would be something like, no, no, that's, that's a stupid idea. We should not tell them that because God's love will always be good. It will always convince them. It will be better than any lie we could tell them. And so then another demon says, well, maybe we should convince them that their sin is bad enough. Let's go tell them that their sin is bad enough. They can never have God's love. And the demons say, well, maybe I guess that could work. But, but they already feel guilt. They already feel shame. They're not going to pursue him anyway, so I don't think that that lie will get us anywhere. And then finally one demon speaks up and he says, I got an idea. Let's go tell them that there's more time. Let's go tell them that there's more time. Let's convince them that there's nothing urgent about the gospel. And all of hell erupts and says, yes, convince them that there's more time. And I think it's one of Satan's biggest lies in our life that there is more time. So go on sinning, 
Don't pursue Christ. Don't pursue evangelism. Don't share the gospel. There's more time. There's always tomorrow. Listen, don't walk out that door again from that person that God's prompted your heart to share the gospel with because there might not be more time. What does God want from me? He wants me to be obedient to his prompting. He wants me to be available for his use. Just as Ananias was available, he wants to be available. He'll tell us what to say. He'll guide us, but he wants us to be available. God's word is working. His revelation is all over in creation. His word, quite literally, the Bible is making clear the incarnate word of Christ, Jesus Christ. This Bible is working. Nature is working. God's sovereignty is working. He wants to work with your efforts, so be available for his use. And finally, I say to you, trust him completely. He wants you to trust him completely. Take him at his word that he's faithful, that he can save even the hardest hearts, that he can change your heart, forgive you of your sin, and save and change any sinner around you. Believe that he's working in general revelation and special revelation. Trust God completely. And I conclude with this statement, not mine, but straight from Scripture. Psalm 3, 8, Psalm 61, verse 2, Revelation 7, verse 10. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He'll call who He wants to call. He'll save who He wants to save. But allow Him to use you to be bold to communicate the truth of Jesus Christ to whoever he's placed in your path. Listen, your words may not always be perfect. Your apologetics may not always be persuasive. But I'm sure that your feeble obedience to the Lord can be used by his sovereign and powerful hand to call people to believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Trust Him. Trust Him completely. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Holy God in heaven, we thank You for Your goodness in our life through a man like Ananias in Your Word to give us an example of what it means to be available for Your use. Father, please have Your way with me. Please have Your way with us. Please allow Your church to be more bold Please allow Christians to have the confidence that you will save even the hardest of hearts around us. And God, will you help us be a people who do trust you, who take you at your word that Christ's payment for our sin is enough, that we can be forgiven and have an unhindered unity with you through the power of your spirit and the forgiveness of your son. We love you, Father. It's in his perfect name we pray. Amen.